Greetings, friends. My name is John Woolman, and I have come all the way from New Jersey, 1771, to tell you something of my experience of a prophetic life, as you say. I bring with me a certificate of recommendation from the annual meeting of the New Jersey Friends, uh, Quakers, you call them, confirming the support of my presence before you today. I have obtained such a recommendation for each journey I have made from 1746 to now throughout the colonies and England. For as you know, prophecy must be confirmed in community. You may be wondering about the color of my raiment. For years I had been burdened by the plight of slaves working in the dye factories, but I was uneasy lest I must be misunderstood in the unique appearance of my clothing. But finally, my conscience would not give me a rest. I would enter deeply into the consideration of these slaves, and living under this weight, my considerations made me feel these things so heavy and their ill effects so extensive that the necessity of attending singly to the divine wisdom was evident. I could support the slave manufactured dye no longer. And having training as a tailor, I was able to acquire clothes of undyed natural fabric. So please, do not think that I'm trying to draw attention to myself by wearing clothing such as this. But rather know that my life, a prophetic life, is one which must be lived with simple integrity to the gospel, no matter what others may think. Which brings me to my story. For I have spent my life trying to listen, to live, to speak in surrender to the truth. My father, Samuel Woolman, manifested much care for us and his children, offering and endeavoring to imprint in our minds the true principles of virtue and particularly to cherish in us a spirit of tenderness, not only to poor people, but also to all the creatures of which he had, God had, the command. From my childhood, I was acquainted with the operations of divine love. Though as I grew older, I fell into youthful vanities here and there and again, till at length, through the merciful continuance of the heavenly visitations, I was made to bow in spirit before the Lord. I kept steady to meetings, spent first days, afternoons, chiefly reading in scripture and other good books, and was early convinced in my mind that true religion consisted in an inward life, wherein the heart doth love and reverence God the Creator, and learn to exercise true justice and goodness. I went to meeting in a frame of mind filled with the awe of God, and endeavored to be inwardly acquainted with the language of the true shepherd. My understanding became more strengthened, to distinguish the language of the pure spirit, which inwardly moves upon the heart and taught me to wait in silence sometimes many weeks together until I felt that rise, which prepares the creature to stand like a trumpet through which the Lord speaks to his flock. Perhaps the turning point for me was in 1742 when I was 22 years old, my employer, having a Negro woman, sold her and directed me to write a bill of sale. The man being waiting, who bought her? Through weakness, I gave way and wrote it. But at executing it, I was so afflicted in my mind that I said before my master and before the friend, who purchased the woman that I believed slavery to be a practice inconsistent with the Christian practice and religion. 
I ordered my life in a plain way, for I saw that a humble man with the blessing of the Lord might live on a little. There was a care on my mind to pass my time as to things outward, that nothing might hinder me from the most steady attention to the voice of the true shepherd. After my employer, a retailer, died, I wrought my trade as a tailor, carefully attending me meetings for worship and discipline, and found an enlargement of gospel love in my mind. And therein, a concern grew to attend and visit some friends in the back settlements of Pennsylvania and Virginia. There, my comrade and I were baptized into a feeling of, of a sense of the conditions of these people. I noticed that where the masters who welcomed us on these visits bore a good share of the burden and lived a frugal life so that their servants were well provided for and their labor moderate, I felt more easy. But where they lived in a costly way and laid heavy burdens on their slaves, my exercise of feeling was often great and I frequently had conversation with them in private concerning it. And so began what became nearly 25 years of periodic traveling from meeting to meeting throughout the colonies. I took occasion to speak with both slaves and slave owners to become acquainted with their conditions, often taking another friend with me. The knowledge of our conduct toward the Negroes had deeply bowed my mind. You knew you who know the only true God and Jesus whom he hath sent and are acquainted with the merciful, benevolent gospel spirit will therein perceive that the indignation of God is kindled against oppression and cruelty. And in beholding the great distress of so numerous a people will find cause for mourning. Some who own slaves were glad of our visits, and in some places the way was more difficult. I often saw the necessity of, of keeping down to the root of where our concern proceeded, allowing the Lord to beget a spirit of sympathy and tenderness in me towards some who were grievously enmeshed in the spirit of this world. Similarly, I would often speak at meetings of our concern for the freedom of the slaves. And there also, I learned to look less at the effects of my labor than at the pure motion and the reality of the concern as it arises from heavenly love. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And as the mind by a humble resignation is united to him, and we utter the words from an inward knowledge and that they arise from the heavenly spring. Though our way may be difficult and require close attention to keep to it, and though the manner in which we may be led may tend to our own abasement, yet if we continue in patience and meekness, Heavenly peace is the reward of our labors. I wrote considerations on the keeping of Negroes and a plea for the poor and other essays. I was so deeply moved that wealth desired for its own sake obstructs the increase of virtue. So many of the hardships of our time have their cause in our desire for luxuries. When our eyes are so single as to discern the selfish spirit clearly, we behold it as the greatest of all tyrants. How can we remember that we are the disciples of the Prince of Peace and the example of humility and plainness which he set for us without feeling an earnest desire to be disentangled from everything connected with selfish customs and food and raiment and houses and in all else. 
I spoke not only about slavery, but also about oppression in factories and in farms, and about our care for the natives of this land. During the French and Indian War, I signed a petition with others, presenting a case for refusing to pay taxes to support war. I refused to send any correspondence to po by post, for I had learned of the mistreatment of both horse and rider in their journeys. And in all these things, what mattered most was obedience to the Spirit and the true love of human family and of all of God's creatures. To attempt to do the Lord's work in our own way and to speak of that which is the burden of the Lord in a way that's easy to the natural part of us does not reach to the bottom of the disorder. To see the failings of our friends and think hard of them without opening that which we ought to open and still carry a face of friendship, this leads to undermining the true foundation of unity. The office of a minister of Christ is weighty, and they who now go forth as watchmen had need be steadily on their guard. It's good for thee to dwell deep, that thou mayest feel and understand the spirits of people and the Spirit of God. Ultimately, my journeys took me to England. There I contracted smallpox and I died. Not long after my death, the Society of Friends gave up the practice of slave keeping many, many years before what you call the abolition movement that gained strength. Today, as I look at you with the eyes of a simple follower of the Spirit, I feel that we have forgotten what it means to be a prophet. Some people make mistake prophecy for a mere interest in what will happen in the future. This does not honor God, whose plans flow from the heart and who reveals to us not merely matters of end times, but matters of his concern for the present. Some people think that they are prophetic simply when they, they speak harsh things against injustice or against political or religious organizations. I too believe that the Lord is not pleased with any form of injustice. Yet, merely to speak the burden of the word in a way easy to ourselves to our natural selves, again, does not reach to the bottom of the disorder. We must address the concerns of God to the depths, both in our own lives and with the utmost love for our fellow Christians and fellow human beings, with the support of our local friends. The weight of the Spirit upon us requires nothing less. Still other people, may think prophecy is only a matter of sudden spiritual experiences where God delivers a message for a person or a group. Well, yes, God does open us to know a message and to deliver it. But we must be heedful. The experience is not always sudden. For me, it was a message that haunted me over years more and more. I was oft spent in tears on behalf of our sisters and brothers in slavery. Prophecy is being confronted by the living God. If we are to be faithful messengers of the divine message, it will require much of us. So, you say you want to live a prophetic life? I say, dwell deeply. Submit to your friends and meeting and obey what you must. I, John Woolman, bid you good day.